Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This episode is the start of a nine part series of Uruguayan wines. These are all free samples, so I have total autonomy in these reviews. Let's get some background on wines in Uruguay. For the record, it's pronounced Uruguay from all the people I heard pronounce it in the webinar I watched. These were people from there. So it's not Uruguay or Uruguay or Uruguay or whatever. I'll do my best to say it correctly too. With that said, the proper Spanish pronunciation is or Uruguay. So pick your poison. I try to use the local pronunciation as much as possible, like Shiraz for Aussie wines. Very likely I'll switch between Uruguay and Uruguay and Uruguay. I mean, I'll probably mess it up throughout these whole nine part series, but just wanted to get that out. First, some basic history. The Spanish and Portuguese arrived early on in the early 1500s, but unlike other areas of South America, the area where Uruguay is located didn't have an abundance of gold and silver. This combined with some pretty heavy resistance by the native population made the area less desirable. It wasn't until about a hundred years later that settlements started popping up with settlers from Spain and Portugal. Along with these, both countries built fortresses. This area continued to be an area of contention between the two countries into the early 1800s. It was then that a series of conflicts occurred between Spain and Portugal along with the settlers. But not only them, the British tried to get into the fray. By 1811, Jose Gervasio Artigas was successful in defeating the Spanish, culminating in the Battle of Las Piedras. At the time, this area was part of present-day Argentina, with Buenos Aires becoming the seat of government in 1813. However, Artigas wasn't happy with how things were initially set up. The area that would become Uruguay was called the Banda Oriental, the areas east of the Uruguay River. He, and he wanted each area to have political and economic autonomy, and the government in Buenos Aires wasn't having it. So he said, screw you guys, I'm going home. And he besieged Montevideo, Montevideo in 1815. That settled things a bit with the government, but the Portuguese had a medal and they ended up annexing the area. Brazil becomes independent in 1822, and Juan Antonio La Vieja seizes upon this opportunity and leads the Trienta y Tres Orientales, or 33 Orientals, to declare independence for the Banda Oriental in 1825. It was effectively a stalemate for 500 days, and in 1828, the UK brokered a peace treaty that created Uruguay as an independent state. Its whole name is the Oriental Republic of Uruguay, or the Eastern Republic of Uruguay. The word oriental or oriental, in case you're unaware, just means eastern in many Romance languages and doesn't specifically refer to Asia, though that's what we currently think of as the Orient as to, of, you know, today. Now keep the names Artigas, La Vieja, and Trienta y Tres in your heads for just a little bit longer. We don't typically think about any other countries in South America when it comes to wine other than really Chile and Argentina. But Uruguay has been making wine for a long time and is the fourth largest producer in South America. Both the Portuguese and Spanish conquistadors arrived in the early 1500s, and as far as winemaking, it appears to have started in the 1600s when European migrants started arriving. These immigrants were mostly from the Basque region of Spain and France, along with Italy. But the modern industry really doesn't get started until about 1870, with the arrival of what is considered Uruguay's signature grape variety, Tanat. It was brought over by Don Pascal Hariage, who was from the Basque region. Fun fact, Hariage has been the local name for Tanat for a very long time. While many countries have three and sometimes four levels of wine as in the quality pyramid, Uruguay has two. Vino de Calidad Preferente, or VCP, is their quality wine category. These wines are required to be made from Vitis vinifera, the same species that we are familiar with, like Cab, Merlot, Chardonnay, etc. 
They're also required to be sold in bottles and can't be any larger than a standard size of 750 milliliters. On the other hand, Vino Commune or Commune VC is their table wine category. There are no restrictions for this wine. It is often sold in demijohns or large plastic jugs or what are called tetra packs. These are cardboard containers that usually have a kind of plastic, plastic screw cap spout versus a spigot in your typical box wine. Like many countries, Uruguay's appellation system just follows normal administrative boundaries of its departments. That makes my life a lot easier when it comes to making maps, especially since other agriculture is grouped into what are called cardinal, in, cardinal intercardinal oriented zones and then subdivided into departments. This is like north, northeast, etc. Now, with that said, you're going to see all these wines are going to be like, they come from blah, blah, blah within an apartment. But that's an administrative area of sorts, you know, um, you know, like a commune, but there's no appellation with that name. Okay. Officially, the wine growing regions are not grouped in this fashion either, like, you know, north, south, east, west type of thing, right? But many people have done this out of convenience. Out of the 19 departments in Uruguay, 14 have wineries and 16 have vineyards. We have the following regions and their official areas with 2022's vineyard and winery stats. So in the Northern Riverside grouping, we have Artigas with one vineyard and two hectares of vi uh, vineyards and one winery. Salto that has 12 vineyards of 55 hectares and three wineries. Paysandu is 17 vineyards of 108 hectares and five wineries. Now the Southern Riverside grouping is Soriana with three vineyards of three total hectares and two wineries. Colonia with 74 vineyards of 299 hectares and 17 wineries. In the Northern grouping, we have Rivera with two vineyards and 28 total hectares and two wineries. Taquarembo has four vineyards of six hectares and one winery. In the Metropolitan grouping, we have San Jose with 34 vineyards of 275 hectares and nine wineries. Canelones is 748 vineyards for a total of 3,882 hectares and 114 wineries. Montevideo is 180 vineyards of 720 hectares planted and 45 wineries. In the central part, we have Durazno with three vineyards with 19 hectares and one winery. We have Florida with four vineyards and 16 hectares, but no wineries. La Vieja has four vineyards of nine hectares planted in one winery. And Trienta y Tres, it's really more east or northeast than central, but since it's by itself, I went ahead and grouped it with uh, this group, is one vineyard of 0 0.6 hectares and one winery. Then we have Oceanic, we have Rocha, which is four vineyards and 19 hectares, but no wineries. Maldonado has 38 vineyards and of 407 hectares planted and 10 wineries. All right, so all told, that's a total of 1,129 vineyards with a total under vine 5,848.6 hectares and 199 wineries per the INAV. That is the official viticultural agency in Uruguay. Departments that don't have any viticulture or wineries are Cerro Largo, Rio Negro, and Flores. Did you remember Artigas, La Vieja, and Trienta y Tres from the history lesson earlier? Well, they ended up being department names. That's why I said remember them. Also, Rio Negro sometimes shows up on wine maps from Wine Uruguay, the official marketing or branding organization, and the INAV. But the INAV's own stats show it shouldn't be included. Maybe prior to the 2022 vintage, there were some grapes harvested. So what I did on, on the INAV, they have like a they have their 2022 harvest report. And they have a map that does not have Rio Negro as anything, have anything in there. But they do have that one vineyard and the one winery in the La Vieja. I'm sorry, in uh, Trienta y Tres. So most maps have Rio Negro, but don't have Trienta y Tres. But when you look at the stats, flip those. 
As you can see, Canelones is by far the most important viticulture area with the most vineyards, acreage under vine, and wineries. After that, Montevideo, Colonia, Maldonado, and San Jose round out the top five. Paysandu and Salto contribute a little bit, but, it's, but then it's pretty minimal after that. As far as grapes, Tanat is the most planted variety, followed by Black Muscat, aka Muscadel de Hamburgo. This is a cross between Schiava Grossa and Muscat of Alexandria. I just learned about this grape in writing the script. It appears this is usually made up made as a rosé wine rather than a red wine, but I wouldn't be surprised if some red is made from it. Plus, the INAV's 2022 report has it in a pink color, as you're seeing right now. Okay, after that, we have Merlot and Uni Blanc rounding out the top four grapes. In looking at their report, they also show the most planted variety by department. It's interesting how Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc show up in these departmental things. Granted, these are in departments that have only a few vineyards and not much acreage under vine. Something to make note of, over 50% of the grapes are harvested by hand in the whole country. Look closely at this map. My Spanish speakers will know what frutilla is. I didn't realize it wasn't a grape at first. It's Spanish for strawberry. From what I can tell, it's a thing to make strawberry wine there, but it's not fully fermented. Crazy that strawberries are the 15th most planted wine fruit between Syrah and Viognier. Some grapes to also be on the lookout for are Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc, Marcelin, my new favorite grape, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Albarino, and Viognier. Some of the wines in this series are made from these grapes. With it being on the ocean, its weather is heavily influenced by the Atlantic Ocean. That's especially important where the vast majority of viticulture is in the southern coastal areas. It's been said that Uruguay is similar to Bordeaux in this regard. Oceanic influence, vineyards planted close to estuaries and rivers, and a relatively humid and mild climate. You have the confluence of two currents right off the coast, the warm Brazil current and the cold Malvinas current, also known as the Falkland current. This area is literally called the Brazil Falkland confluence. Because of this merging of warm and cold currents, it helps keep the area's climate on the moderate side. Even in the northern riverside areas, you have the Uruguay River that forms the western boundary of the country and the Damon River that forms the boundary between the Department of Salto and Pesandu. However, with it being an inland area, overall temperatures are higher and you'll find larger diurnal shift because of the rivers. The departments of Rivera and Tacorembo are more continental in nature, also higher in altitude since their vineyards aren't near coast or river. A decent amount of rainfall happens here, but the soils are more sand than clay, so they are well drained. Speaking of soils, they are mostly calcareous that are rich in clay for most of the wine growing areas, but you'll also find some granitic soils here. Another similarity to Bordeaux here is many parts of Bordeaux have mostly clay soils, such as saint Emilion and much of the Medoc, though other areas are more gravelly, usually in the major villages of the left bank of Bordeaux. Okay, let's wrap up with some more facts. Uruguay means river of painted birds in the indigenous Guarani language. It's South America's second smallest country after Suriname, with a population of 3.4 million. That's less than Brooklyn and Manhattan combined. Now that I got you up to speed on Uruguayan wine overall, let's get some background on today's wine. The land here was initially settled by the Jesuits in 1745. They were granted over 400,000 hectares of land by the Council of Montevideo. This place was huge. And reading the history pages, you'll see that it was extremely important in the region until 1767, when the Spanish crown expelled the Jesuits. This essentially stripped them of their lands and sent them into exile. So around this time, the property was transferred to a private individual. The translation of the winery's website on this is a bit confusing as it implies someone with the name Juanico took over. But then in 1830, we see that the land was transferred 
or establish. Well, this is the establishmiento part of the name. Anyway, so it was transferred to Don Francisco Juanico. So I'm not sure if the property was owned by someone else or it took that long to transfer ownership to a private individual. Don Francisco was a Menorcan migrant from Mahon. This is the island of Menorca and is part of the Catalan part of Spain. It stayed in the Juanico family until the early 20th century. It then changed hands a couple times with it being purchased by a company for the purpose of making brandy. At least that's how I read it. In 1979, the Diecas family purchased the property and they returned it to winemaking. It is still owned by the Diecas family with Santiago Diecas being the strategy director and quote, family winemaker. Juan Carlos Diecas is listed as the founder along with Fernando Diecas as president. Juan Carlos is Santiago's grandfather and Fernando is his father. Now, their chief winemaker is Adriana Gutierrez, She's from Uruguay and started at the winery when she was just 21 years old. She became the chief winemaker in 2011. When it comes to vineyards, they manage 307 hectares of vineyards that they actually own. In addition to that, they manage over 150 hectares of vineyards for other wineries. All grapes are hand harvested across their vineyards and properties. From everything on their website, plus info on the INAVI website, the winery is a certified sustainable winery. The INAVI has, has its own sustainability program. Now, as far as this wine, I don't see the logo on this bottle or any of the other bottles in the series. And other than a small version on the INAVI's website, I can't find the, the, the sustainability logo anywhere else. With that said, I know that the winery implements many strategies to be sustainable. Maybe it's such a new program that the logos need more time. Plus, from the webinar I watched, sustainability is something everyone is working towards in the whole country. About 10% of the vineyards are certified sustainable from what, the website, from what the webinar said. Okay, enough of all this. It's time for the wine. The 2022 established Cimiento Juanico Don Pascual Coastal White Albarino Blend. The suggested retail price is $12 from Uruguay. The grapes are Alboreño from the Maldonado department, Chardonnay also from the Maldonado department, Pinot Grigio from the Canelones department, and Verdejo from the Canelones department. Uh, they are hand harvested. It's cold fermentation, aged on leaves for two to four months, and the ABV is 12%. Remember that Don Pascual was uh, the iconic figure in the Uruguayan wine history by planting the first Tanat vines in Uruguay. All right, let's get into the wine. Because uh, I'm thirsty. Anyway, let's drink some water first. All right, nine Uruguayan wines. It's a tall tale for me to do. I recorded all these the same day. I recorded those Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. So, now it's more nighttime. Super excited. So I've had an Albarino from Uruguay from a different producer. And I'll try to remember when I get to that producer, because we're doing uh, wine from them too, not, not Albarino, but um, and it was super delicious. So I got high hopes that this one's going to be super delicious too. All righty. It's a white wine. So, I mean... <laughs> No, let's just talk about the color. I mean, it's a light straw color, so let's just check it out. So I'd call it a more medium plus aromatics. Nothing really jumps out at me out of the glass. I mean, there's a bit of salinity, I guess. That's about it I'm really getting. I mean, I get a touch of orange, which is what I usually expect from like Albarino, but I mean, we got three other grapes in here, or at least from what I can tell from the text sheet. L let me qualify that. It's not that the text sheet had had that. It's let me uh, let me just. It's I think it was on there. I'm, I'm just gonna go to the website. I know I, I promised I wouldn't do this, and I I've been really good at not like looking stuff up while I'm doing the review. But I'm gonna look at this one more time. Oh, one thing to kind of talk about, and it's is it on this bottle? It's not on this. It is. It's hard to tell because it, it, the logo is kind of hard to tell. But here, and a lot of the and a lot of the labels will have um, the picture of a pregnant woman to basically say 
if you're pregnant, don't drink alcohol. I thought that was kind of interesting, uh, just on a personal note for me. All right, so I'm going to real quick, our wines, Coastal, just because you know, I had the whole maybe thing in there and I just really, really want to double check that. Yeah, it's okay. So it does have, it does have four, says it, and a hint of Pinot Grigio and Canalones. So what I meant by the maybe was that they're there, but I was guessing where they were from, not that they were, that the varieties were in there. Um, and the reason I talk about that way is that, um, this wine is just listed as Uruguay. It doesn't have an apartment. I think it's the only wine that I'm doing where the department isn't mentioned on the label. Everybody else has a department, I think. Hey, it's been a while since I, not a while, but it's, it's been, you know, a long weekend writing scripts for like almost 20 wines. Anyway, with that said, it tastes good. It's something more in the palate than, than the nose. I get that kind of, kind of tart orange thing going on, or a little bit of orange blossom. Um, there's this kind of salinity going on to it. It's not a complex wine. It's just super refreshing. It's something that you just kind of just chill and drink. Now, uh, kind of like the Sauvignon Blancs from the Chile section, um, this is pretty much room temperature right now. I pulled them out of the fridge a long time ago because I actually thought I was gonna sit down in the kind of mid afternoon to record all this, but it took forever to download all the videos from the phone into the computer. Um, I thought just lunchtime it would work and it didn't. So now it's getting close to dinner time and I'm probably gonna record like half of these wines and have dinner, but that's not important right now. Anyway, um, so the, the white wines definitely warmed up to a point where they're it's kind of in that um, uh, uh, room temperature thing, which, as I mentioned in the last set, that's actually a good way to evaluate white wine. It was my old, old, old school way of evaluating white wines. So, I mean, it's gonna be as aromatic and as flavorful as it's gonna get. I feel like it's a little bit of grassiness to it. It's very refreshing, a little bit of tartness to it. Um, acidity's kinda of high. I don't have an acidity number that I remember from this. Um, no, there wasn't, it was just, just the ABV. That was one thing about like these wines, like the, the Chilean wines, they all had like, they had all these like extra stats, whereas the Uruguay wines, they're kind of all over the place on what's, uh, on how detailed they'll get in stats, but that's fine. I was surprised the Sauvignon Blancs from Chile had as many uh, stats they had to begin with, but it's a very refreshing wine. Um, like I say, you get a little bit of salinity, uh, you get a little bit of orange, it's really crisp, it's it's really bright, a uh, touch of orange blossom. So a little bit of flor uh, floral notes to it. Um, it's kind of a neutral wine, which um, that's what happens. It's, it's part of that uh, Bermuda Triangle that I mentioned in the last set of reviews of Albarino, Gr Gruner, Veltliner, Pinot Grigio. And well, it's got Albarino and Pinot Grigio in there. And then sometimes I'll throw in Chablis. Well, it's got Chardonnay in there. So, I mean, it's got, a lot of grapes that can come across as neutral depending on the wine style. It's got elements of all those. So it's got elements of, you know, Albarino, which is just probably its lead grape. Well, I mean, it says Albarino blend on it, not just Albarino. Um, then the Pinot Grigio, that's probably really adding a lot of, I mean, depending on the percentage, it's probably adding even more of that kind of brightness or that crispness or that freshness to it. And then the Chardonnay is probably giving a little bit of extra body. Um, so I feel like it's a com it definitely is a combination of those three grapes, uh, plus the, um, what was it, uh, the Verdejo, which I don't drink a lot of Verdejo on its own, so I don't necessarily have like a great um, uh, knowledge of what Verdejo itself is going to be like, though, I mean, all the ones I've ever had I thought were really delicious, but again, they're all, it's also in that refreshing uh, style of wine. It's, it's not like um, anything that's like super off the, off the chart that I can remember. This is a, just a combination of those grapes. I mean, it's a very pleasant wine. It's not very expensive, um, easy, easy to drink. This absolutely could be just something you just drink on its own. You're sitting out on a porch or you're sitting next to the, next to the ocean or a river or whatever. Um, you do, you do this with lighter fare, like salads, maybe a fruit salad, that kind of thing. Um, it's not super, super like tart or really high, really, really high in acidity. So, um, it can go with, I think, 
depending on the type of food, maybe a little bit wider range of food than some other white wines. But yeah, it smells and tastes really good. There's also this apple. There's, now I'm getting a little bit more. There's a little apple going on, green apple. That's your Chardonnay, really, for me. Yeah, that green apple coming through. It's almost like that green apple sour candy. Um, almost like almost like that. But yeah, it's just opening up a little bit more now that it's kind of in the glass rather than in the bottle. Uh, it's very pleasant. I like it. Yeah. All right. I think you should, if you find it, get it. All right. So that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends. And we'll see you next time. Cha -cha.